deep desires here at South Bay as your pastor is to raise up other pastors in the house. And I have my eye on four men inside of South Bay that are on staff that you're going to be seeing regularly throughout 2018 because I want to see their gifts uh, grow in excellence. Paul told Timothy to devote himself to the developing of his gifts. So that's what we're doing here. And if you remember last year, I told you that we were going to be doing this and that when these men are up on this platform, we're to encourage them, love them, listen to them, build them up in their faith, because who knows what the Lord's going to be doing with these men. He's going to change the world with them, I think. That's what my plan is. So, so uh, today, uh, Sean Doherty, who's one of our staff, is going to be sharing the word with you. I, I listened to this message already. I'm going to listen to it again. It's powerful, and it's right in line with all that we've been talking about since January. So I'm going to ask Sean to come on out. Would you welcome him? Thank you, Sean. God bless you, brother. Thank you, thank you. I just want to take a quick moment and honor our pastor. Uh, can you give him a big hand? Come on. It's such a joy to serve with him. I mean, I get the privilege of, of like he was saying, working in our creative ministries, and, and I meet one-on-one -on -one with him. And what you see here on a Sunday, I want to encourage you, it's the same you see on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, back again Sunday. He is just a man that cares. He loves our community. He loves each and every one of you. Um, and I'm grateful to serve with him. Um, I want to let you know real quick uh, about something else that I do here at the church. I, as well as working with our our creative, which is the graphics, the web, our videos. Um, I work a lot with our young adult ministry. Uh, that's our 18 to 30-somethings. Do we have any 18 to 30s in the house? Come on, make some noise. I hear, I hear you. You're out there. Um, so yeah, our 18 to 30s, about a year ago, I asked Pastor, hey, uh, I noticed that we're missing this age range in our church, not just as like a ministry, but even just uh, as a demographic. We just weren't reaching that age range. Um, and I, I took on on growing that ministry. We had a couple uh, of people that met for a devotional each week, and it was going well. Um, and since then, um, we have grown to four different small groups, meaning throughout the week that go through different things, and we're growing. And I want it to grow grow more, uh, because what I don't want to see happen one day uh, is the church grow and grow old, and want to hand, we want to hand off the church to the next generation, and there's nobody there to take it. I don't want to see that happen. I want to see our young adults, the next in line, take it and make it better. Amen, church? All right, so, yes, it's so good. I love people. Um, yeah, so we're, we're about to go through a new study. It's called Swipe Right. It's a love and relationship study. And to swipe right, basically, it's a new cultural term. Uh, it, it's using apps like Tinder and Match and all that. You go and look for dates on your phone. And based off of a profile picture and a couple sentences, you either say, I want to date this person or I don't. It's real simple, real easy. But I believe uh, that there's more to relationships than just your picture and a couple sentences about you, right? So... This book is an amazing resource, and we're about to go through it as our young adults um, in our small groups, and I don't want anyone to miss it. So if you are in the age range of 18 to 30, maybe your kid is 18 to 30, or you know someone at work or in your neighborhood, I encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center as we're finishing service. My wife is going to be out there selling books. We bought a bunch for only $10 each. Um, I'd encourage you to grab one, grab a couple, invite people to group. You can even sign up for a group today right out there for our young adults. Um, um, we're going to kick this off right after Easter, so I encourage everybody to grab a copy um, and, and invite your friends. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, I want to pray, and then we're going to hop into the message today. So, God, thank you uh, so much for what you're doing in this house. Thank you for South Bay being a place where the name of Jesus is lifted high each and every Sunday. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice would have open hearts to hear your word today, God. We're grateful. We pray that all of this would be made uh, new in your glory this Sunday. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 All right. Well, today I titled this message, if you're taking notes, it's selfless, 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 selfless. Um, 
And uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit about that today. Uh, have you ever been kind of labeled as someone that always does something? Whether that be um, your wife or your husband or maybe a coworker or somebody, they said you're always like this. Um, I know for me, I, uh, I know I'm gonna be in trouble, but I don't, I don't watch a lot of sports. I'm not really a big sports guy. Stay with me, everybody. Um, <laughs> but I'm more of a, more of a video game guy. Uh, anybody here play some, some video games? Solitaire on your Windows XP? There, I see you. Yes, I'll get you. Um, I'm more of a video game guy. It's just who I've always been. I used to play my Super Nintendo, hop on that with some Zelda. Um, I'm preaching to anyone today. Um, we are the, the few and the proud. Uh, but I used to play games a lot. I still play them. I don't play them as much. I don't have much time with my daughter now, but um, I, I still like to hop on it. And I found myself about eight months ago, I share games with a couple friends, and uh, I found myself playing a lot of new ones, and I ran out of time in the day often. And my wife came up to me, and she was like, Sean, you are always on your phone, always on your Xbox. You're, you're need to, you need to stop. Um, and of course, after that, I, I went to the Bible, and I prayed, and I, I fasted for months about this, and <laughs> just kidding. I just, I just said I'll go an hour and see what happens, and I realized, yeah, I, I do like playing games, and they're pretty fun, and I have a problem. So, uh, so I'm sitting there, I find out that I'm always on my phone, I'm always playing games. This year I made it a big resolution to read more books, get involved with more uh, activities than just a TV. But um, have you ever been told that you're always doing something? Uh, maybe you've been told that you're always encouraging, or you're always griping, or, or maybe you're always finding faults, or, or maybe you're always finding good. Um, you know, for some of us, we're always working. We're always working out. Um, that's not me. I wish it was. But uh, or maybe you're always at your business. You're you're working hard on your startup, but you're losing everything else. Or or maybe you're always sharing Christ. Um, and and you know I'm going here, but I'm going to go there anyway. Maybe you're always on Facebook and Instagram, checking out your stories and hoping that people will like them. Um, but for some of us, you know, we're, we're always doing that. Um, today, 2018, we are more than ever a self-serving, self-gratifying, self-promoting culture, right? We, uh, we just love it. It's who we are. It's who we've been made to be um, because of social media and different things like that. I went on Google and looked up a couple of articles. I could do so many, but these are the first three that I found. Um, the first one, is the art of self-promotion, six ways to get your work discovered. So not only do you need to work hard, this article saying you need to actually get it out there and get it discovered as well. It's not good enough to just work hard. Another article from Forbes said that self-promotion is a skill. So not only do you need to work hard and get it discovered, you need to also hone your skill. Another one that maybe some of us need to look at today is 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it is what it is. So these are what the it's a little popular media is saying to us. It's what we're believing. Our next generation in a study, teens said that more than half of teens, when they were asked, what do you want to do when you get older, said that they want to be a YouTube star. That's what they want to be. More than anything else, just get me some subscribe, uh, sub sub subscribe to my page, like my videos, I don't know, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, for a career, that same group said that 54% uh, of them said they want to be a celebrity. So what kind, who knows? But as long as you like me and I promote myself, I just want to be a celebrity. Uh, we want to be the GOAT, ladies and gentlemen. And for those of you that don't know, I'll give you a little bit, you know, the youth pastor, I'll give you some, I'll give you some culture today. Uh, the GOAT, hashtag GOAT, uh, is the greatest of all time. So now you can look cool with your friends and say, you're a GOAT. And they probably won't know what you're talking about, but GOAT is the greatest of all time. Hashtag GOAT. It's a thing. Look it up. Uh, <laughs> But in Matthew 23, 11, and this is the kind of uh, core point of my sermon today, it says that the greatest among you will be your what? Your servant. Your servant. So to be the goat, to be the greatest, you need to be a servant. And the big thing about today, that if, I, if you don't get anything else, I hope you get this, is that serving is not something we do. It's not something we do. It is who we are. At the core of our being, as Christ followers, we are a servant. 
we are. I think it's good if we say this uh, together. Would you repeat after me? I am a servant. Come on. I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. One more time. I am a servant of the Most High God. When I serve others, I am serving Christ. You can declare that to yourself today in Jesus' name. Come on. All right, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 9, and uh, it's going to be on the screens for you, too. I've got a bunch of verses today, so uh, if you want to write that down, um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And uh, it's a quick story about someone that served, someone that always lived a life of serving. If somebody come up to this lady, they would say, you are always serving. Uh, it says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge this lady was at a disadvantage. Her name was Dorcas. All right, so Dorcas, uh, she was always doing good and helping the poor. And scholars believe this lady was so beautiful, people remembered her as a gazelle. She was highly favored in the community. People loved her, and yet she lived her life um, serving. In the Bible, uh, it even talks about that she's, she's the first female Greek ever to be mentioned in the New Testament. And she as well uh, died, and Peter brought her back to life because she was so important. And so many people came to know Christ because of this. Um, she lived a life who, uh, who, who people would say she's always serving, right? Um, for us today, though, we may say, look, I mean, she's, she's serving. She's probably, you know, knitting clothing for the elderly and taking care of widows. You know, that sounds great, Sean. I don't have time for that. I can't do that. Um, but what I want to share with you today are three simple ways to serve anytime, anywhere. Three simple ways. They are, you can bring a lunch, Offer a ride, carry a towel. Bring a lunch, offer a ride, carry a towel. These are the three ways that you can serve. And the first one, let's hop into it. Let's bring a lunch. Bring a lunch. I want to take you back to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at King David. King David, we know about him because he was a war hero, right? He's a brave king, a man after God's own heart. Um, we know about him because of his victorious victory over Goliath, and he rose in notoriety because of that. And we even know that he was loved and honored. In the Old Testament, we read that as David came back from battles, women would just cry out in happiness, singing songs of praise for King David. And I, uh, real talk for a moment, you know, when I work here and I come home after a long day of creativity in the office, you know, I just hope that my wife would be in the yard singing songs of praise. Kelly would just be out there saying, Sean, I'm so glad you're home. I've written a song for you today. <laughs> it's never happened, but maybe today, maybe today it can change. But in, in, in all truth, uh, most think of David as someone that won battles, who was a king, who was victorious. But we don't remember uh, often about how he was a student as a child. And he grew in that time because of, of his growth in that time. He actually became king. So David, for those of you who don't know, was the youngest of eight of Jesse's sons. So eight sons he had. David was the youngest. And all of his sons, other than David, were out fighting the Philistines when he was a kid. Either fighting them or preparing to fight. They were always out doing stuff. And David was the one that sat behind and just wanted to be with them but didn't have a chance. His father wouldn't let him. So we read here in 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 17. It says, One day Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. In other words, you want to fight in battle, David, I need you to bring a lunch to your brothers. Bring back a report of what you're doing. You want to be mighty in the kingdom of God, you got to start with the little things because God values that. He absolutely does. You want to be great, 
you need to understand that your greatness is not grown in the spotlight, it's grown in the behind the scenes. So being selfless is being the greatest, and being the greatest means you are my servant. That's what the Lord says. So number one, bring a lunch. Number two, offer a ride. Offer a ride. So today marks historically Palm Sunday. This 2,000 years ago was the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to be crowned king of glory and to fulfill the prophecy of old. And actually, 550 years before that is when that prophecy was written. It's written by a prophet of the name of Zechariah, and he declared that a king would ride into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey. Humbly on a donkey. And back then, this was a scandalous prophecy. I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure, believe that this was a metaphor, right? Um, because when you think of it, if you even will go with me to one of the greatest of Tolkien stories, Lord of the Rings, there are kings in that in that movie and uh, I think of it as a movie but it's a book but it was a movie to me but there are, there's kings in this movie that come in on white stallions they've got robes they've got trumpets blaring as they enter cities and yet uh, Jesus is, is being foretold to come in on a donkey it's it's like if a king were to come here you probably would see him come in on a stretched limo but instead the king's coming in on his little moped you know going pop, 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 riding into South Bay it'd be pretty strange pretty weird uh, we might not even believe he's a real king, but, but Jesus believed that he must fulfill the prophecy. This is what is to come. And he'd ride in on a donkey. So he lets his disciples know, hey, go find me a donkey. And it speaks here in Luke 19.31. It says, if anyone asks you why you are untying it, say the Lord needs it. Say the Lord needs it. So the disciples go out. They go to find a donkey um, to fulfill what Jesus is asking. And we see that, um, well, we see them find a businessman probably. Uh, owning donkeys back then is, is a luxury. It's not like owning cars and everything today. Owning a donkey meant that you, you, you had wealth and you probably own a couple of them. So uh, they went to find a donkey. They found this businessman. And we don't know what his name is. We don't know what he did for a living. We just know he had a donkey and it was a brand new donkey. And he gave it away. And we notice in the story he does it like that quick. He says, take it if the Lord needs it. And, and it even says that this is a brand new donkey. So, you know, the businessman doesn't go to the disciples and say, oh, I didn't know you wanted this donkey. This is my uh, luxury. This is an Eeyore. This is the luxury model of my donkey with the low mileage and the upgraded hooves. Uh, I'm going to charge you a high tax. Uh, no, he gives it away because the Lord needs it. And he just wants to be a servant. He just wants to help. And by doing that, he he didn't even know it, but he is fulfilling a prophecy. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to take victory in Jesus' name, in his own name. So he offered a ride. He made a way for Jesus. So if you want to be a servant, you can bring a lunch. You can offer a ride. Number three, you can carry a towel. Carry a towel. So Jesus, a couple days later, is sitting on Thursday night on the historical day of Passover. He's in the upper room with his disciples, and they spin off into an argument. They talk about who is the goat, the greatest of all time. And Jesus, during that, he, he knows he's about to give his life for these people. Um, but he's just sitting back watching. And they start arguing. They start talking about who's the greatest. And I can imagine it. I don't know if you ever put a little bit of uh, creativity into your scripture reading, but I can imagine them arguing back and forth, right? We've got all the disciples running around. And we've got, uh, first of all, we've got John over here. And John's sitting there saying, well, of course, I'm the greatest of all time. I'm the one that Jesus loves. And, uh, you know, the weird side note here is John wrote his own name into the Bible, right? He wrote a book of the Bible. In that book, he wrote, I am the one Jesus loved. So we already know that John was a little full of himself, right? I mean, it's a true story. Go read it. But John's saying, hey, I'm the one Jesus loved. Look, I wrote it right here. It's the uncanned word of God. But Peter is probably over here saying, well, hold on, John. How many steps have you taken on water, right? I have walked on water. And then John's, of course, well, you sank. Anybody can sink. Yes, but I not only sank, but was pulled out from the water. And Jesus held me. 
has he ever held you? Right? And they're going back and forth. They're doing their thing. Then right over here, probably hiding underneath a little table or something, was Bartholomew. And he's like, well, hey, a minute. And then oh, uh, the disciples are standing here, and they're like, oh, Bartholomew, we forgot you were with us. Hey, how's it going? You're the 12th disciple. Right. Uh, did you get some of the dinner yet or no? Okay. So they're all going back and forth. They're doing their thing, right? And Jesus looks up and he sees proud hearts and dirty feet. And he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And back then, I mean, washing feet isn't really that uncommon of a practice. It happened a lot. It's like if I were to say, hey, come, you want to come over to my house later? We can play some Xbox. Um, I, would, I would open the door and I'd say, hey, can I get your coat? You want a drink? Can I wash your feet? I wouldn't be, however, the one washing the feet. That's a job for my servant. And sadly, back then, this was commonplace, but it'd actually be more like the job of a slave. That's what they did. They'd say, come in here and give my boy a pedicure real quick. I'll be right back. So Jesus looks around. He sees proud hearts and humble feet. And we read in John 13, for, uh, verse 4, so Jesus got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. You know, it's a job of a slave, a job of a servant, but Jesus took it on because he knew it's what he needed to do. It's who he was. He didn't have a choice because it was at the core of his being. He is a servant. Jesus, for those of you who don't know his name, I want to give a moment to remind you, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the living water, the Lamb of God, the true vine, and the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world, the living stone, the King of glory, Prince of peace, the great high priest, righteous judge, chosen one. Come on, somebody. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega. Our Redeemer, our Rock, our Salvation, and our Righteousness. He is all of that, and he gets down on his feet, and he washes these disciples' feet. Jesus didn't come to serve, but he came to serve others. So you bring a lunch, you offer a ride, carry a towel. These are ways that you can serve. And it's important to understand that when you serve others, you are serving Christ. It is not a meaningless task. It's not a character issue. It's not something that's going to make you morally a good person or not a good person. It simply is that when you are serving others, you are serving Christ. I want to read this to you because at the end of our days, Jesus is going to stand looking upon sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. Matthew 25 says this. And it says that when the Son of Man comes in glory, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd will. And I'm not making this up. It says that he will shepherd them by separating them by sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. And when he put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. He's looking out. And he's going to see the goats. He's going to see the people that believe they are the greatest of all time. I've done X, Y, Z. I've met this person and that person, Jesus. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm a blessing to have in your kingdom, right? And like that, they're gone. Because Jesus says later on, he says in Matthew 25, I didn't know you, never knew you. And then he looks at the sheep and he lets the sheep know, thank you for saving these people. Thank you for bringing me food when I was hungry. Thank you for inviting me into your home and thank you for visiting me while I was in prison. The sheep, I'm sure at this point, will be confused. They'll be like, all right, Jesus, whatever. I'm just glad I'm here. I'm going to, you know, waddle off here. Um, but Jesus says, verse 40 in Matthew 25, the king will reply, truly I tell you whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. So when you do something on earth, it is not just for now. It value, the value of it is in eternity. When you serve others, you are not just serving others. You are serving Christ. He will say one day, the scriptures say, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
servant. Serving is not something we do, it is who we are. It is our identity at the core of our being as Christ followers. You say, you can't do much, but in the kingdom of God, he values the little things. It is important to him. You say, you can't do much, but you can hold a baby from a mother who needs a break. You say, you can't do much, but maybe you can greet someone with a smiling face when they come into church on Sunday, shake their hand, have a meaningful conversation. You say, you can't do much, but maybe you can open up your home for a small season, for a small group to meet, and for those to find Christ for the first time in your living room. So maybe you can't do much, but you can, you can love on a teenager for a season, or you can read books to little kids, or maybe you can even cook up some of that sweet southern barbecue that we all love so much. Um, because one day we hope, we believe, and we trust that Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and he'll be looking at you, and he'll be looking at me when he says that. We want that, because serving is not just something we do, you know it by now, it is something we are, it is who we are. So if you came in, you should on your seats have a little card that has a bunch of ways you can serve at the church. Uh, that card just simply represents some of the ministries that need help, uh, that can't that can't fulfill the roles, especially going into three services next week of what we need. And even on the back, there's an empty space for you just to write something down. I want to pray today for those of you who are Christ followers who aren't serving that want something. They want to be core. They want to change the core of their identity to be someone who serves. So if you would go ahead and grab that paper out, and when you're done, outstretch your hands like this. This posture represents to receive. I believe it's symbolic and it's important that we do this today. So would you do that with me? Would you stretch your hands out with me to receive from the Lord something, something, whatever it is. So God, thank you so much for what you're speaking today. Thank you for a message that is absolutely timely for today. Lord, I pray that anybody who has their hands stretched out would receive a word from you today. God, that your message would be given to them. Lord, whatever it is, whether it's a serving role here at church or not, whether it's a, a lifestyle change, maybe it's a word or a phrase, but Lord, I pray that you would speak, God, that we would listen and receive your reign in this house today, Jesus. We're grateful, we're thankful. We just want more, we want more of you, God. More of you, Jesus. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.